Thanks, Neil, and good morning slash afternoon, everyone. I'm here to talk about SFA's view on um, or a high level, present SFA's high level overview of uh, the basics of a battery technology and why lithium ion batteries have become the go to for um, electric vehicles. And um, before handing over to my colleague Tom, who will talk about the lithium market in particular from a supply perspective. SFA has been around for over 20 years um, and we provide market advisory services um, and regular commodity in a reports on, on a whole host of commodities. The company was established um, primarily as a PGM reporting slash consulting um, think tank and has since expanded into energy transition metals like lithium, nickel and cobalt, but also focus on more recently the implications of the hydrogen economy um, and also just the overall or wider implications of the energy transition on, on the metals and mining industry. So I'm going to start this uh, talk by covering at a high level, as I, as I alluded to, the different how batteries work and also why we believe lithium ion batteries um, are kind of the go to solution for battery electric vehicles, despite there being competing technologies and competing rechargeable batteries. So essentially, the diagram on the left shows the different components within contained within a lithium ion battery. These the, the, the main three components are the two electrodes. App, uh, dubbed the cathode and anode respectively, um, and these are separated by an aptly named separator. During normal operation, ions of a given metal, in a, the case of lithium ion, it's lithium ions, move between the cathode and the anode through the separator, and the ability of the two electrodes to hold essentially the, the number of ions that these two um, electrodes can, can contain um, and the rate at which ions can move between or through the separator between the two electrodes determines the overall performance of the cell. This is the same for as in this, the mechanics of this are the same for all batteries, be they lead acid, nickel metal hydride or the current state of the art lithium ion cells or even going forward um, lithium solid state cells. So on the right here, you can see the performance envelope of these rechargeable cells, and they're rechargeable because you can essentially reverse this process of um, moving the ions between the two electrodes. And that's pr pr pretty much the only difference between a non-rechargeable and a rechargeable cell. You can essentially move the ions back and repeat the process. So on the right, you can see the performance envelope for these different cells. And essentially, the higher energy density uh, or the further along the x-axis you move, the longer your range and the higher your power density, the faster the car can accelerate. Um, and lithium ion offers essentially the highest uh, performance on both these metrics, which is why it has been become the, the, the universal standard. In the last 12 to 18 months, there have been uh, commercialization developments for sodium ion cells, but our view is that and um, that the the performance of sodium ion cells, especially in the first generation, um, which is towards the lower end, they're not apt for the EV application. Rather, where they are suited for is in alternatives um, which are less demanding on energy density or power density requirements. If we move on, we can see this um, through this essentially a Venn diagram. So if we were to separate the main emerging end uses for electrochemical storage in, in the different end use segments, there are primarily two, which is electric vehicles, and on the other side of the equation, you have energy storage systems. Energy storage systems have much lower energy density requirements 
um, because space isn't as big of a constraint, unlike a car where there is limited space. Essentially, a car has fixed dimensions, um, typically in a, in a given segment. Also, energy storage systems have a much longer design life. So in theory, you can depreciate that asset over a long period of time, whereas in an electric car, they have typically a shorter life. So, but, but the main driver for lithium ion being suitable in electric vehicles or more suitable in electric vehicles is the energy density requirements that are that consumers expect, um, i.e. consumers expect a minimum range from the electric vehicles and non-lithium based batteries are not high enough energy density to, to, to offer though. That's not to say they will never be, but the current technology um, doesn't allow that. And we're seeing that in the technical specifications for the first generation sodium ion cells, the energy densities they have are much lower than lithium ion. Where sodium ion does make sense is, as I said, energy storage. These cells are inherently cheaper um, than lithium ion because of the abundance or relative abundance of sodium over lithium and the use of different but essentially cheaper cathodes. Again, although the best cathode for sodium ion is yet to be determined. So it's not entirely true to say that sodium ion batteries won't use the likes of nickel or cobalt. Some cathodes do actually use them, but in lower, lower intensities. In our view, um, we predict sodium ion to capture roughly 5% of the energy storage demand by 2030. But predominantly for electric vehicles, we do see lithium ion um, being the leading technology. Now within lithium ion, there are different cathodes and on moving on, we can see that today, the, back, the, the market is dominated by nickel-based cathodes. Over the last, say, 18 months or so, um, you can see on the, the, the pie charts, these, or the, the donor charts rather, these show the split by overarching chemistry. I've not broken it down by the different compositions of NMC. Um, or nickel manganese cobalt oxide cathodes um, to show kind of the, the the splits between high nickel versus low nickel cathodes. I just want to focus on the overarching theme, which is the majority of um, roughly 60% this year in the first nine months of this year, um, or 70% of all battery installations by capacity have been using a nickel-based cathode, and roughly 30% um, at a global level is lithium ion phosphate or LFP cathode, which contains no nickel and no cobalt. However, on a regional basis, this is very much a function of an almost 50% market share of um, LFP in China and the proliferation of LFP outside of China remains relatively minute. It is expanding to some degree in the US, as you can see in the bottom right donut in 2023, um, and it even expanded a bit last year. That is a function of predominantly Tesla producing uh, or Tesla switching to LFP in, in the standard range models. However, the cells for these are still produced in China and they're, and they're imported. Um, and it's the same for Europe. So the, there is some scope for localized production of LFP, but it, it will take a few years for these LFP gigafactories to, to start producing and reach scale production. But for now, LFP remains predominantly a function of the Chinese market. And this is important for the precursors because nickel rich chemistries require the use of lithium hydroxide. So now let me move on to the powertrain trends um, and sales trends that we've observed in 2023 and 
SFA's um, EV production forecast and overall what that means for um, the lithium demand market as well. So BEV sales in 2023, or rather the growth of BEV sales in 2023 has indeed slowed. And this isn't just a lower percentage because we are moving from a higher base. The growth in units, as, as the top left-hand side chart shows, has is indeed 500,000 units lower um, than it was this time last year uh, between the first, oh, it, during the first nine months of the year. Last year, the number of units was about 2.2 million units greater than in 2021. And this year, we're only up 1.7 million units um, compared to 2022. Now, this is this growth, or, or these, I guess, lost units, if, if you want to call it that, have primarily come from China, where we're almost 900,000 units behind. And this is a function of uh, loss, in, loss in confidence from the Chinese consumer from price wars that uh, occurred kind of during the first half of the year as as the OEMs battled to retain market share, but also um, NEV, NEV subsidies were kind of, were were slashed uh, at the start of the year, um, so there was uh, a normalization of growth to an extent, um, and of course there is the overarching macroeconomic condition which. Um, or macroeconomic outlook for, for China is much worse than was forecast at the start of the year. So, so there has been effectively lower, um, almost a million units lost um, of growth lost in China between last year and this year. The outperformer this year has actually been Europe, as, uh, as illustrated on the on the um, bottom left chart. Well, we are up over 200 or a quarter of a million units between this year and last year. Now, this isn't enough to offset the losses in China, but it is showing that the region or the, the consumer demand pull from the region for electrification of, um, or, or for EVs rather, does remain strong, um, regardless of the macroeconomic outlook. The US is a bit strange because there are both pull and push factors here. On the pull side, best, the best selling EVs or the best selling OEMs have had uplift from the Inflation Reduction Act where the likes of Tesla and GM cars are now benefiting from the federal subsidy again. Um, and overall more on, on a, for over a medium term, from a forecast perspective, you are seeing more investments um, in the North American supply chain. However, on the push side of things, you have things like the point of sale um, or the implementation of the point of sale um, access to the, the federal rebates from the Inflation Reduction Act coming in from 2024. Um, you have the intent of the OEMs all switching to North American charging standard from as early as model year 2025, so from September 2024 onwards. Um, and these are kind of incentivizing consumers to wait. So um, to, to, to wait till next year. So, so while sales are growing in North America, there is kind of a soft cap. Um, and this is, so as, over time, we expect these kind of consumer, I guess, deterrence to buy an EV to reduce. Um, and specifically for the North American market, we are also seeing more electrified pickups coming to market, more um, larger SUVs, um, which suit consumer preferences in the region. Um, so as these models come to market, overall electrification efforts should increase as well. Despite this slowing growth narrative, it is also important to keep in mind that this slower growth is still in a, still outperforming the wider automotive market. In, in basically all, um, all countries, 
Now, the chart on the left shows you the top 15 um, by uh, BEV sales, and you can see that the top bar in dark blue is basically bigger than the light blue in on all countries. The only exception being South Korea, where there has been a slight decline. The only country outside of the top 15 presented here where this trend of um, BEV sales outperforming the wider automotive market um, doesn't hold outside of South Korea, like I said, is the Philippines. Now, again, on the right hand side, you can also see that this growth, um, BEV unit sales, they're still increasing uh, in, again, almost every market, um, with the exception of South Korea. Uh, like I said, but again, South Korea as well, it's still flat, basically flat. However, this growth um, has meant that, or this, this slowdown in China's growth, rather, has meant that China's share of global BEV sales has dropped um from 50 uh to 55% from over 60% last year and this could drop further um if this growth trend continues in the last quarter of the year just to note that these figures are for year to september so this is uh the unit sales are comparing like for like moving on if we look at the how the evolution of our forecasts has um, has happened. You can see that historically there have been, you know, for over two years we are up almost fifty percent um, from for twenty twenty seven. We were at about seventeen million units, and we're now forecasting over twenty five million units by twenty twenty seven. And this is just for battery electric vehicles. And by twenty thirty, that number is increasing from the just from around 32 million to 36 million units in the space of a year. In a EV penetration terms, this equates to about 35% um, of all light duty vehicles by 2030. So by that, I mean passenger cars and light commercial vehicles like delivery vans, etc. But this is weighted. Um, but this is, if, if you look at just purely passenger cars across all segments, um, that penetration rate is closer to 40%. So it is being weighed down by the commercial vehicles. The upgrade in growth is actually primarily coming from Chinese OEMs, um, which is quite strange because we it's counterintuitive almost, as, as I've just stated, that the sales in China are slowing, but the Chinese OEMs are actually producing more and prim the likes of BYD, they're actually looking to export more and increase their market share in ex-China markets. So while Chinese sales growth has decreased this year, Chinese production has actually increased um, and Chinese OEMs are looking to, to increase their market share in, in, no, uh, in international markets. And so from a consumption of metal perspective, China still remains the the, the dominant force, or put another way, from an upstream perspective, Chinese trends or Chinese um, upstream players will continue to, to an extent, dictate the the overall um, structure of the the upstream supply chain based on today's conditions. I just want to now move on to the US and highlight the kind of changes that we've seen as a re result of the Inflation Reduction Act. So on the upstream side, or from, from, a, from an OEM perspective, what we've seen is, and you can see, um, we've seen a slew of announcements by OEMs and also cell makers, um, cathode makers, both to invest in North America to take advantage of the Inflation Reduction Act incentives, but also in, in Canada, where the government is almost matching the equivalent incentives. And what we've, what we've seen in the US is the emergence of this almost battery belt um, in, 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 eastern, uh, in the eastern United States from the uh, surrounding 
Illinois, and Kentucky, Tennessee, and Georgia. You can see this concentration of yellow dots on the screen. It, this is counterintuitive because if we if we look at the U.S. market um, from a from where from a state level wide policy, the the states where these production hubs are emerging are actually the ones that um, don't incentivize car ownership at all, uh, or sorry, don't incentivize the owning EVs rather. So the likes of you can see Georgia and Kentucky, for example, in gray, that have no specific statewide policies on that incentivize EVs. Rather, it's California, Colorado, um, are the main, are the, are the leading states which offer up to up to $5,000 of additional credit on top of the IRA plus, um, you know, up to basically up to $7,500 uh, additional. So this is on top of the IRA in Colorado. It is, the, the, the point here is that it isn't necessarily the states where the, the EVs are being sold, which will be where the materials um, are being consumed. And so it doesn't necessarily matter on the politics of which who wins the next year's election on whether the IRA will be changed or the rebates will be changed. Um, by and large, most of the Inflation Reduction Act incentives have actually been, su subsidies have been awarded to um, quote unquote red states. So it's counterintuitive to believe that if a Republican victory happens next year, that those subsidies will be revoked at this point in time. And so I know that there have been a lot of questions asked to us specifically by our clients on what happens if 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 a Republican president comes in next year um, or in 2025. We don't view that as a huge risk on the Inflation Reduction Act. It could impact future allocation of uh, of of subsidies or future awards, but the money that's already been awarded, we don't see that going anywhere. And, and that's kind of the, the point of the last two slides is the spotlight on North America and the extent to what um, the resolution with which SFA is tracking this market. So circling back to what all this means for lithium demand, we see the gross lithium demand increasing roughly 23% annually out to 2030, reaching roughly two and or exceeding two and a half million tons by 2030. And this is an increase of about 1.8 million tons um, over from where we are today. Of this 1.8 million tons, 1.5 we see coming from EVs, and the bulk of that is coming from battery electric vehicles. Plug-in hybrids and heavy duties are the next biggest contributors, but the average battery pack sizes on BEVs combined with the overall larger production volumes that we forecast or that, that we see coming through means that the growth is essentially weighted to battery electric vehicles. So purely um, battery propelled, essentially um, combustion in uh, battery propelled passenger cars. We see energy storage providing a kick in the second half of the decade. And while growth rates are high, these are of a relatively small base. So but energy storage um, should be a significant growth factor next decade or a significant contributor to growth in the next um, from the 2030 onwards, but out to 2030 growth is limited from the segment and the likes of um, consumer electronics such as laptops and mobile phones. These have a essentially much lower growth rate in our view um, and their intensity of use is also much lower. So there is both the volume and the battery size factor there. So that's everything from me. And I'll now hand over to Tom, who will talk um, through the, the supply side of the lithium market. Thanks. Thanks, Laksha. Um, yeah, so I'm here today to talk about the lithium market. 
um, and what this means for supply and the overall market um, when compared to demand. So as you would have seen um, in Ash's last slides, the amount of demand we project out to 2030 is quite considerable. Um, so on our first slide, you can see our demand, our supply projections, um, including existing operations and what we call probable projects. Um, so these include those that are under construction or are board approved and have are fully funded. Um, as you can see, out to 2030, there's quite considerable growth of over a million tonnes in lithium carbonate equivalent terms. Um, this primarily is coming from places that are traditional lithium mining locations, such as Australia and Argentina. So there's a number of uh, expansions, existing mines, uh, spodromy mines in Australia, and also some recently commissioned new mines in Western Australia as well. Um, likewise, in Argentina, there's been expansions at the existing brine operations there, um, but also a number of new brine operations are currently under construction or in commissioning phase, um, and I'd like to add to supply from the region as well. A bit further out in the, in the latter half of the decade, we get a lot more additional supply from new mines in Africa. Um, a lot of these are based in places such as Zimbabwe and Mali, and many of which are Chinese owned or funded. Um, likewise, in the latter half of the 2020s, we see an uh, emerging supply from North America as well. So this would include um, spodumene mines in Canada and some clay sedimentary deposits in, in the US. And also in this period, we see Sabanis so water owned caliber starting up production and um, adding to supply from Europe as well. So when we compare this to the demand projections, um, so you can see on the left hand side, we have primary lithium supply. Um, so the solid orange bars are the existing operations, the existing mines, and then you have the probable projects and then the possible projects um, split into their level of risk, essentially. So low risk, medium risk and high risk. Um, and then on the right, you've got net, uh, you've got lithium demand net of recycling. Um, and you can see that when you compare the two out to 2030, even with the probable projects in the construction and the lowest risk possible projects, we're still a bit short of what is required to, to meet demand projections. Um, and this is largely, as Lacha would have mentioned, due to growth in BEV demand. And you can see uh, at the bottom right the sort of regional split in terms of growth of electric vehicle demand, but also a BEV demand primarily, um, largely coming from China, Western Europe and, and the US. And then on the bottom left, you can see again where this potential new supply is coming from. So you can see that you know primarily primary lithium supply from existing operations is largely stagnant from 2024, 2025 onwards. Um, and again, a lot of this is coming from Australia and Africa, the Chinese backs mines in Zimbabwe, as I mentioned. But further out, the projects are primarily based again in Australia and Argentina. And like I said before, you get the US and Canada becoming potentially quite key contributors to supply um, over the, the medium to long term. Of course, a number of these projects have risks associated to them with them. Um, and a lot of the supply, the, you know, as, you, as I've said, a lot of the supply, additional supply required is coming from, is likely to come from medium risk and high risk possible projects. And obviously with those, being greater risk, the likelihood of delays or them not reaching production at all increases. Um, so of course, that means further investment is still required in supply to, to keep up with our demand projections. Um, here you can see it in a slightly different way. Um, this is our 
2030 demand versus supply projection. Um, so on the left hand version of the chart, you have a demand column. So, you know, energy storage, hybrids, other end uses, and then BEVs, lithium demand for, for use in BEVs on top. Um, and then that's stacked alongside potential supply, um, which you can see existing operations, lithium supply from recycling, and then the probable, um, the different categories of possible projects stacked on top of each other. Um, and you can see that, again, similarly to the previous slide, that there is potentially enough lithium supply from these projects. But when we, our probability assessment, um, and we sort of gauge just how likely, how likely we think each of these individual projects are to come online, um, you get the chart on the right hand side. And so you're going from potentially enough projects, but to, to meet demand um, and produce enough lithium to be able to produce or the number of BEVs predicted, um, to potentially there not being enough supply at all once we factor in our probability assessment. Um, so you can see that whilst when we when you when we determine the likelihood of these higher risk projects and the chance that they may be delayed, we, we get a situation where by 2030 the likelihood is that there still may be a shortfall in supply. Um, so like I said, this could be down slightly down to delays, there's likely to be delays at various different projects. Um, this could be related to issues with permitting, um, local opposition, various different uncertainty related to the resource types or the processing routes and difficulties in the execution and the, the technicalities of these different routes and the projects themselves. Um, so the potential shortfall is equivalent to the production of 5.8 million BEVs. Um, so this, of course, may not, this is just sort of a, a figure to highlight the number of, or the, the amount of uh, production at risk um, in simple BEV terms. Of course, in reality, BEV production would likely to be prioritised, or the, the lithium use would likely to be prioritised for utilisation in lithium-ion batteries for BEVs. Um, and in actual fact, the demands, other demand segments, or maybe energy storage, may um, switch to alternative technologies or alternative metals to account for this shortfall. Um, but it just highlights again the risk that despite their theoretically being enough projects, there still could be a shortfall in supply through the various technical and execution risks associated with many of these projects. Um, and then looking at Europe specifically, um, so Europe is an even more extreme example of, of that trend in the sense that European demand uh, far exceeds the potential local lithium supply. Um, so demand from EVs alone is estimated to reach 450 kilotons in LC lithium carbonate equivalent on a lithium carbonate equivalent basis by 2030, um, with BEVs accounting for 85% of this demand by the end of the decade. But lithium supply um, or mined lithium supply is, is forecast to just be 164 kilotons including all the probable and low medium and high risk possible projects um, so as you can see this is quite a considerable gap quite a considerable shortfall um, and it is again equivalent to Approximately, this is same, approximately 75 percent of Europe's plan BV production being at risk. Um, this is, you know, of course, assuming all the high risk possible supply comes on stream, which 
is far from certain given the various issues uh, we've had in Europe recently, um, which theoretically means even more local uh, European BUV production could be under threat. Um, just to highlight some of these issues we've had, uh, as you may well have seen, um, there's been a lot of local opposition and permitting issues that have threatened hard rock lithium projects. Um, they've already derailed the Jadar project in, in Serbia and more recently a, a threatening projects in Portugal and also Spain. And whilst the Critical Raw Materials Act aims to help streamline the, the permitting process for these projects in the EU, it's not yet been um, adopted and so there is, you know, the outcome of the Act has, has not yet been seen um, because of the risks associated to European projects. The region may actually fail to meet its CRMA extraction target um, that at least 10% of the EU's lithium consumption is mined locally in 2030. Um, now, excluding high risk possible projects, the, the EU's figure for this would be less than 10%. Um, however, if all these projects were to come online as planned, then that would be equivalent to 30% of lithium demand in 2030. So again, it's highly dependent on these, the region is highly dependent on these high risk um, lithium projects to even meet their targets. Um, but yet, yeah, still with them, it remains far from self-sufficiency, um, not just in mining, but also potentially in processing and refining, um, which of course means that European EV supply chain is likely to be highly reliant on raw material and lithium product imports from overseas um, in 2030. Um, but of course, a lot of other regions are looking to expand production, um, downstream production as well. Um, and so global competition for raw lithium is likely to be fierce, which may limit um, material availability. So just to touch again a bit on that potential capacity um, utilization elsewhere and the other parts of the world that are looking that are looking for um, additional lithium supply from places such as Africa and Australia and South America. And you can see here that China's utilization capacity, um, so the monthly operating rate for lithium carbonate capacity is on the left and the equivalent for lithium hydroxide capacity is on the right. And just the fact that throughout the past nearly five years, the capacity for both in China has been largely underutilized. And so there is still plenty of companies out there looking to find as much raw lithium, where it be concentrate or lithium carbonate to, to convert into to hydroxides, um, as much of that as, as they possibly can to, to fill capacity and, and you know, in, in increase profitability, and increase revenue. And so to summarise, um, this is what it means in terms of supply demand balances and price forecasts. Um, as you can see, as stated, um, there's the solid green bar is the current balance based on existing operations. Um, then as you go across one, you've got the balance including probable projects and then including low risk possible projects. And you can see that in the medium term through to 2026, the probable and low risk possible projects could keep the market um, well supplied. But when you go further out into the latter half of the decade, you do see mountain deficits, even including these lowest risk projects, um, therefore requiring, requiring the development and commissioning of the higher risk projects as, as already stated. Um, therefore, on a price basis, we still, we although the price is like to reach 
the floor in 2024. Um, we do think it's like to start rising again over the longer term, um, helping to incentivize these high risk projects. And even at current levels, um, despite price still falling slowly, a lot of projects should still be incentivized um, and should still continue to develop. And you can see that in the in this rising price period is, is when both Caliber and Royal Outridge are set to begin production. Uh, so to conclude, um, lithium ion batteries uh, set to remain the go-to solution for electric vehicles, and NMC is likely to remain the globally dominant cathode chemistry. Um, whilst sales growth has slowed slightly in China, they continue, BV sales continue to outperform the wider automotive sector. And we project, latest projections indicate a 35% penetration of BEVs uh, by 2030. In terms of lithium, prices are predicted to stabilise at what are historically very high levels and rise longer term, um, continuing to incentivise the high risk projects. Um, of course, if further investment is still needed in supply, to meet our demand projections out to 2030, otherwise the equivalent of 6 million BUVs could be at risk based on potential shortfalls if the medium and high risk possible projects are excluded. And like I said, in Europe, 75% of BUV production is likely to be reliant on imported lithium. And so just finally, this gives me an opportunity to invite you to the SFA Oxford Battery Metals Lectures um, in May next year. Um, we have quite a track record of hosting these kind of events over the past 14 years. Um, with speakers ranging from CEOs to key decision makers um, across the battery value chain. And with that, I shall pass on to James for questions.